fast center sometimes unannounced. <laughs> He's very close to Geshe Sundu. So they both uh, have some affinity and Geshe Sundu managed to persuade. <laughs> Same comes in. Sawa comes in from Sarah. Yeah. So we are seeing a very special Osa Hitter tonight center, with sometimes. the Chuba because of Geshe Sundu. <laughs> Thank you very much, Geshe Sundu, for, for doing this for us. So Lamo Osa uh, was born in 1985. 38 years, young man, um, who is a reincarnation of Lama Yeshi, the found, founding, founder of the uh, Foundation for Preservation of Mahayana Tradition. Like Lama Yeshi, he is very unconventional, very creative, spontaneous, and very direct, and is a very down-to-earth person. He cares a lot to the environment, and thus he initiated this movement, non-governmental organization called Global Initiative for Tree. It's called Global Tree Initiative. And um, this is an NGO that promotes planting trees in this earth, which is very sick. Like Osa shared with me just now, tree gives us the oxygen, which is an important lifeline of our life. Just like spiritual practice. So tree is actually as important as stupa and holy objects. So we should protect our earth that we need to live on and uh, by planting tree. So you can go to the website called um, Global Tree Initiative and there's also a poster and some, um, certainly this is an NGO and if you um, have the same um, intention, want to help, please also can do some donation through us and then we will uh, support the Global Tree Initiative. This initiative has been um, planting a lot of trees in many countries. And it said that you, when we plant the tree, we grow our forest and we save our future. Like that, um, uh, Lama has been very busy with this work. And also another thing that uh, Lama has been doing is this called Habit Alignment Key Retreat, H-A-K. This H-A-K retreat has been organized for the last two times in California and Mexico. And this, after this, Osa is going to New Zealand and then Australia to conduct. And it's a very important retreat that transforms the body and the mind of an individual. So you can hear more about it. Maybe Osa can talk about it during the interactive session. Um, so we encourage all of you to ask questions and uh, be interactive. That's how Osa would like this session to be. Without further ado, I would like to invite Lama Osa here to share this evening a wonderful talk, whatever content of the, to us who live in this 21st century. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so nice to see all of you. I'm sorry about the time because I'm sure all of you have to work. So this is a schedule, right? And I'm very grateful that after your work, you still come here. You must be really tired. So I'm going to try my best to offer you something that you can apply in your life to improve. That's what we're all looking for, right? We're looking to improve our life. So I'm just going to dedicate first. Okay, I'm going to... Sangye jin so yegive sonam gi drola penje sangye du bara sho sangye chedam chogi chonam la changju pardo dane kepsu sangye jin so yegive sonam gi drola penje sangye du bara sho so yeah i have some notes prepared but i also i would like for all of you to participate and um, so in a while, uh, maybe I'll ask if you want to give me a few subjects that you would like me to talk about, okay? But um, I'll probably start talking about everyday life <laughs> and how to apply Dharma in our everyday life. Because I think that's really the most, uh, the thing that we need the most at this time. Um, and, Today, we have uh, many issues in our life, like depression. We feel isolated, right? And we have stress. 
And then of course, where the mind goes, the mind, uh, the body follows. So healthy mind equals healthy body. Unhealthy mind equals unhealthy body. Because the body really follows the mind, right? Um, so there's a very strong connection between the mind and the body, right? According to you, what you eat, what you take, what you feel, then also it can affect the mind, right? And vice versa. Also, how you think, the attitude you have, how you treat yourself and how you treat others, the relationship you have will also have an effect on the body. Because the body is, um, is alive, right? <laughs> So first of all, if we think about the how how much work all the cells in our body are doing constantly for us, we don't really remember every day. From since we were a fetus in the in the womb of our mother, from two weeks already the heart starts to pump, and it never stops for the rest of our life. So that's dedication. But we don't really remember much the body until the body starts giving us problems. Then we remember the body. <laughs> so it's important, you know, to to always begin the morning with a gratitude meditation. So why is gratitude so important? Because really that is the base for everything that we want in life, right? What is it that we want? We want to be happy, right? We want peace of mind. We want others to be happy also. We want to be productive. We want to be accepted, recognized, be part of something, right? Functional, et cetera, et cetera. So if we're not grateful, for example, then uh, we it, this creates a feeling of insatisfaction. If you're not grateful, then you think about yesterday, you think about tomorrow, you think about what you don't have, what you want, what you would like. Right? When you're insatisfied, you don't think about what you have. Never, right? <laughs> so how to reverse that is by being grateful. So you wake up in the morning and, and if you practice that, it's really going to start to have an effect in your life because that's going to change your attitude and your perception. These two things are really the key that the Dharma is talking about. You know? You change your perception, you change your attitude, and you change your life, literally. So, the, so how to start is with the gratitude, always. So when you're grat grateful, for example, so you think, okay, what are you grateful for? Start thinking, right? So many things, so many things. Like right now, what do we have? We have a space. If it starts raining, we're protected. Right, we have so many beautiful sisters and brothers here, which we are share. We share, you know, we share the connection. And of course, we have a body. We have oxygen. We can breathe, and it just goes on and on and on. Even if you think about when your great great grandfather met your great great grandmother and the circumstances for them to meet, also that is something we can be grateful for. Because if they hadn't met, we wouldn't exist. So how many details, how many conditions have to come together for us to exist? Actually, they say life is a miracle. And it is literally a miracle because it's almost impossible, you know, to be con for the conceivement to happen. It's almost impossible or literally impossible if you think scientifically, you know. So really life is a miracle. And that we're able to interact with life and actually apply the uh, universal law that Dharma talks about. Because the universal law that Dharma talks about is you can apply for everybody. That's why it's a universal, right? <laughs> and um, it's a little bit different like from the medicine, right? So for example, if somebody is sick, you can't give him all the medicines. You have to find which is the right medicine for, for that sickness or for that issue, right? So in the same way, we also have to find what works for us, you know? It's just, so 
just because you take a text and you start reading, 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 you know, it can get to a point where you can get a little bit frustrated because maybe you don't understand everything or maybe you can't relate to it, right? So what I'm trying to say is that you really have to find what works for you and, and filter that, you know, because not everybody uh, needs the same medicine, right? So first you have to identify what is the cause, right? What is the situation? So for me, the best medicine is gratitude right now, because that is the beginning. When you wake up, you open your eyes, ah, you breathe, wow, I'm so grateful. But if you wake up in the morning, oh no, I'm unhappy, oh, this problem, that problem, then what happened? If you have a black wolf and you have a white wolf, and you feed every day the black wolf, this is ancient, the American Indian, saying okay so if you have a black wolf you give the black wolf every day food what's going to happen the black wolf is going to become big in your life it's going to prevail negativity will prevail and will become very important but if you give more importance to positivity and you feed the white wolf every day the white wolf is going to become much more prevalent much more important and what's going to prevail positivity right if you have positivity inside, then no matter what happens outside, you can't really blame others. It's very easy to blame. This is the easiest thing <laughs> is to blame. <laughs> is if you blame others, you don't have to take responsibility. So for example, very, very typical common blaming is, oh, I lost patience with such and such person. But actually you lost patience with yourself, right? Who do you lose patience with? Where does it start? Inside, yeah? Not outside. You lose the patience inside with yourself. So if you are patient with yourself, you'll be patient with everybody. If you respect yourself, you will respect everybody. If you don't respect yourself, then it's hard to respect others, you know? So really, you have to start applying yourself first. It's like with the love, also the same, you know? If you don't love yourself, it's hard to love other people, you know? And um, also in the in the concept of uh, Buddhist Dharma, when they talk about bodhicitta, it's also you have to start with yourself. Because it sometimes is a misunderstanding. All mother sentient beings, all mother sentient beings, all mother and then you forget about yourself. <laughs> and then you give, 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 and then, you know, and then what happened? You don't give yourself. And then what happened? <laughs> and then you have nothing to give. <laughs> So you have to give to yourself first. Once you, it's like that, you know, in the plane, they show you uh, every time you get on the plane, who has to put the the thing, the mask first? Who put, do you put the, the thing to the child first or you put to you first? Put to yourself and then you put the child, right? Why is that? It's, it's a similar kind of uh, logic, right? So if you have Gratitude in your heart from the very moment you wake up. Because actually when you go to sleep, it's like a metaphoric death. When you wake up, it's a metaphoric rebirth. Every day, the morning you wake up, you're fresh, you're young, right? And then at the end of the day, what happened? You become tired, you know, you become old, right? But actually, old, young is only the mind. My grandfather, he was 94. He was super young. <laughs> it's really the attitude and the perception. So in the morning, you wake up, and then slowly, slowly at night, you get tired. So this is life. You're young, you get old, and then you die, right? So every day, we're preparing for death. And we're experiencing that. So and that's why it's, it's very important to really understand Stand a little bit, even, you know, even if you touch the surface of this concept. This is going to help you a lot to probably become more happy, actually. For me, gratitude is really the base of many good things. Many good things. That's why I wanted to start today with the gratitude. And that's why I keep repeating. <laughs> it's important, really. It's very important. So, for example... Um, when you're great, when you're grateful, this is a conversation we we're having before. When you're grateful, you don't have that attachment 
what is attachment actually? If you search, attachment is fear of losing. That's it. It's very simple. But if you're grateful, then you don't have that fear of losing because you have it. You already have it. You're grateful. You're, wow, thank you for having it. So then you don't have a fear of losing it because you have it. Fear of losing is going into the future that, and thinking about future, past, da 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 da, da right? But the, the past exists in the present, and the future comes from the present, right? So you observe the present, you can understand better the past, you can understand better the future. So when you're attached to something that you that's not yours, really, I mean, what is yours? The only thing that's really ours is our values, our memory, our karma, our conscience, our, you know, the, what do you call it? Consci conscience. Conscience? Shiba. <laughs> this is this is ours. When we when we when we die, we take it with us. Nobody can steal. We can never lose that. The values, for example, when you share, what happens? It multiplies. Right? And you can take it to your next life. Nobody can steal. You don't have to be worried about anything. You know, the outside wealth is brings wow, a lot of uh, worry and a lot of things happening there, you know? So the values today in society are actually upside down. Material wealth is not really that important. If it was important, all the billionaires would be super happy. But I don't think they're so happy, actually. You know, apparently, you know, apparently maybe, but appearances always are, what do you call that? They're not really... They misguide you, appearance. <laughs> so really, the actual true values that society is forgetting a little bit about is the inner values inside. And this one, if you practice, that is really going to give you what you want, which is happiness or non-unhappiness. Non-unhappiness is much easier than happiness. <laughs> right? It's much easier to not be unhappy than to be happy. Because if you think about it, what is happiness? It's temporary. Just like suffering. Temporary suffering, temporary happiness. So what's all the fuss about? You know? It's an attachment. It's a concept. It's a misconcept of the values. You know? And, um, yeah, I mean, of course, we need to eat. We need a roof. So we need the basic things to be not unhappy, obviously. So these things are the first things that we should be grateful for. And once we start this meditation, the rest of the day is going to be there. It's going to be there. It's like in your childhood, right? And when your childhood, what you learn, what you experience in the childhood is going to affect you the rest of your life. So what you do in the morning is going to affect you the rest of the day. So the attachment... Attachment is really in the in Dharma, it talks about attachment is one of the main reasons for suffering. <laughs> so fear of losing what you don't have. So how can you fear losing something that, that's not yours? Right? Because the car, oh, this is my new car, my new car. And then one day you go to and it's gone. Somebody stole it. Oh, it's not my car anymore. Somebody else is using it. Right? If it was yours, nobody could steal it from you, right? This body, is this ours or not? We're using it temporary. But if somebody shoots you, finish, the body is, is gone. So really the body is temporary also. We're, it, it's, it's almost like a, you know, a vehicle. It's like almost like a car. <laughs> we change car, no? We change car. So... When people get so attached to the body, you know, like I know people looking at the mirror all the time. <laughs> but actually, you know, then they get so attached to a concept because really beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, right? It's, it changes. Perspective is really the one responsible for beauty. <laughs> because, you know, it depends, you know, like how you see the world is your choice. And that's why the second thing I want to talk about is the two keys. 
which Dharma talks about attitude and perception. So <clears throat> I like to work with examples. So for example, for some people, the same situation can be really, really, really bad. For some other people, maybe exactly the same situation, maybe not so bad. Why? Because of the perception, because of the attitude. You know, so this is really where we have to start to understand how the mind plays games with us. I'll, sh I'll show you another example. I like to use this example very much. If we do a group photo, like today we do group photo afterwards, if you want. <laughs> so then when, when they, maybe the group photo come on social media, wherever, what is the first thing we're going to do when we look at the photo? We look for me, me, big me, I, right? It's the first thing we do is that. Where, oh, and the first thought you have, oh, I'm not so look, good looking. Ayala. <laughs> Everybody's so good looking, but not me so much. You know, you put yourself down. You know, we put ourselves, we do, we tend to do that. We are programmed that way. You know, we have to understand that we program ourselves. The subconscious is very important to program the subconscious so that we actively become what we want to become, you know? Many times we are just a mediocre version of our potential. And we know it, actually, we actually know it. But we are scared of that potential. We're scared of our potential, you know, because we have been convinced in a way programmed that we're very small, we're insignificant, you know. Like we, we don't really make a difference in the world, but actually we are very significant. So this is the, the balance. You, ha you have to be a little bit proud but you also have to be a little bit humble. Extremes are not good. You know, it's not healthy. So be proud because you are, but be humble because you belong, right? So the example I wanted to say about the photo is you look and you're, immediately you're judging yourself, right? Judging yourself. I, I do that. That's I don't know about others, but for me, this is <laughs> very typical of me. Oh, I don't like my, my face. I look in the mirror. I'm like, oh, no, I don't want to look. <laughs> It's, I think it's normal, right? Um, because we have a lot of self-criticism, uh, low maybe self-esteem because of the situation, society, you know, also sometimes makes us feel a little bit like that, you know? Why? For example, I'll give example. Because you're thinking, how, oh, why? Okay, let me show you an example. For example, I have friends who are models, right? And they have photos on the publicity, right? But the same model wants to look like her. But that's her, supposedly. But it's not her. Why? Because they put so much makeup and then Photoshop, a lot of Photoshop. Make the throw the this thing, this one here, the thing, make eyes long, nose, da 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 da. And then even the same person who is a model, look at the photo and say, Wow, I, I wish I was like that. Right? This is the idealization of society. It's the concept of beauty. And we suffer because we think, oh, I have to be like that. Otherwise, I won't be accepted. You know, because this is one of the things, one of the things that we really want is to be accepted, to be recognized. Right. That's why social media is so popular. Bing. Oh, we get a dopamine. <gasps> Somebody likes it. Somebody liked what I posted. Right. This is the, it's natural. But where does this come from? Right. Where does it come from? So I'll touch. We'll talk about that later. I wasn't going too far away. <laughs> So I'll go back to the photo. Um, and then what happens? So we see the photo. Oh, you know, I'm I'm not so handsome or beautiful, whatever. We have this self-criticism. And then what afterwards, maybe 10 years pass. And you see the exact same photo. You do the same thing, right? You search for yourself. And then, but something changed. What changed? Oh, I was so young then, I was so handsome. So beautiful, but now not anymore, right? But the photo is exactly the same photo. The photo hasn't changed. Apparently it hasn't changed. Of course it changed, but apparently it didn't change. Same photo. So what changed? Our mind, our perception, our attitude. The attitude towards that person 10 years ago is very different than the attitude we have today. Why? Ah, this you have to investigate. It's very, this is called analytical meditation. It's complementary with the practical meditation. You have to put together. Not just analytical, not just practical, but you have to put together, right? They both complement each other. 
so that's why this is a very good example to show how your perception and your attitude really has an effect on your state of mind. So for example, if you have a very positive attitude, no matter what happens, you're going to be positive and then people are going to want to be around you because you help them uplift. You know, you help them to up uplift because of your attitude. And where does that attitude come from? From the perception. How you see, you choose how to see the reality. You can see it as very negative or you can see it as very positive. That's up to you. It's your choice. It's your job. Nobody can do that for you. Right? We have a responsibility, each of us, with ourselves. And there's nobody else to blame about anything. <laughs> Oh, my parents didn't up bringing me. Oh, they all did this, all this school. Oh, da, 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 da. We we'll always look and search for reasons to put ourselves down, to be unsatisfied, to be unhappy. You know, we always, because that's how we're programmed, right? Why are we programmed like that? Because it's called capitalism, it's called consumerism. You know, if we are satisfied, like for example, if, if people had a lot of self esteem, the cosmetic industry would go bankrupt. For example, it's just an example, right? So that's why also we try to fill up a empty space we have inside by buying, buying, buying. We think that's going to bring us happiness, you know? But the moment it's ours, we start finding defects. But when it's not ours, wow, well, we idealize, so oh, when I have that, I'll be happy. When I have the perfect marriage, or the perfect family, or the perfect job, or the car, or the whatever it is, doesn't matter, or the guru even. You know, people, a lot of people idealize the guru, get so attached to the guru. You, know, you have to check. Then it's becoming counterproductive. That's why extremes are not healthy. We really have to, you know, check our mind every day. <laughs> and what we do we don't check our mind we check everybody else <laughs> and then we criticize huh? but what happens when you criticize people lose respect for you because you know what they think? Oh, if he's criticizing someone else behind the back, maybe they'll criticize me also behind my back. You understand? So criticizing really is not very productive. You know, but that's also the mind. The mind is always searching for something, some mistake, something, you know, like why? Because this is the way we protect not having to look inside, not having to take responsibility. It's more, very easy to blame the outside. But you create your circumstances. Karma is very clear. They talk about karma. If you think about people, I've seen this example many times, you know, people who have the perfect circumstances and they don't really use it. And some people have terrible circumstances, but they somehow are able to transform and create the circumstances they need to grow. So really it's not about the circumstances. If it were, in the boiling water, if you put the potato, what happens to the potato in boiling water? Being soft, yeah? Become the hard one becomes soft. If you put the egg, what happens? Become hard. But the water is exactly the same. Circumstances are the same. But the egg decides to be hard. The potato decides to become soft. So you have to choose. You can't blame the, the, the hot water. Oh, because of the hot water, I became hot. Oh, I became soft. You know, right? You have to choose and you have to take responsibility. You know, and then you make your own circumstances by changing your attitude and your perspective. Does that make sense? Any questions? No questions? I don't know if that's very good if you don't have questions. <laughs> you have to ask questions. You have to always, um, what do you call it? Um... Challenge, challenge, and analyze, question, 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 everything. Yes, please. Yeah, they know about the three as a school. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe you could 
uh, explain more. Yeah, definitely. Because now I like we this. need uh, trees, you know. So okay, I'll, I'll talk about that definitely. Then we come back again, okay? <laughs> so yeah, the trees. Um, but actually, this question is not really related to what we're talking about. But anyways, it's okay. <laughs> So the stupas is, um, I mean, of course, you know, what is what is a Buddha? When you look at the Buddha statue, what is it? It's a representation of our potential. For example, if you see uh, the guru, right? The guru. The guru inspires us. Why? Because it's like, oh, the, the potential we have, where we can get to. So then it inspires, right? So the Buddha's, are really there to inspire us to 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 understand that we can become like that also, right? Today in today you do open magazine Forbes, oh the billionaires, how, who is the richest man on the planet? Oh, I wish I was a millionaire. Oh, but then what happened? You know, like why don't we have this same feeling to become a better person? You know, to become like a Buddha. We are, we are more attached to the idealization of becoming a millionaire, which is quite unrealistic. But then we have available the potential of becoming Buddha and we don't really give too much attention. Even if you just meditate five, 10 minutes a day, that's huge difference. Just five, 10 minutes. You know, how, how many hours do we work? We work at least eight hours, eight, nine hours. We sleep maybe six, seven hours, right? So already two thirds of our life we're working and sleeping. Then we have one third left to eat, right? To shower, to to like uh, go to do. So for eating we have to do shopping. So the time to go to do shopping, coming back, cooking, eating. So we don't really have much time. So five ten minutes is enough. You don't really need so much more. And when you start to see results, then you will start, okay, 10 minutes become 15 minutes, 15 minutes become 20. But don't force yourself. You know, if you force yourself, then it becomes counterproductive. You know, it's not about controlling. We always want to put everything in boxes. We want to control, control, control. But look, inside the body, we don't even know what's happening inside the body. We can't control anything inside the body. How, why we want to control everything outside? We can't even control our mind. Forget about controlling. <laughs> it's a little bit ironic, no? So anyways, so the stupas also are a representation of the stages, right? And the tree, for me, at least, it's a, it's a very important aspect of life because it's the most advanced machine that creates oxygen. I don't know any other machine in the world that creates oxygen for free, like a tree. Right? And if we don't have oxygen, then we can't breathe, we can't live, we can't practice Dharma either. So I think it's more relevant today in the 21st century to plant trees than maybe to build stupas. And please forgive me if I'm wrong. <laughs> and I'm sure many people wouldn't agree with me. <laughs> but I think sometimes it's good to be practical. You know, because if we don't have oxygen, even if we have many stupas, we won't be able to survive. They already gave a date of human extinction, 100 years from now, theoretically. In 100 years, the human race will be extinct. That's what the scientists are saying. So we still have an opportunity today to change that, right? Because if, if, human, if, human, if they get extinct, then how are we going to continue practicing Dharma? You know, to become enlightened, you have to have a human body. Ra, Gishila. I had a doubt now. Eh, dunno me. Eh, subo eh migi subo jimena ani sange tumara. Re mare. Re? Chidam jeng osun do tokba tharje me je gyula de me khansa se sam dirwa. And it's a me minor, Sangi Kabura, Tendu, Sangi, that you had a year at the drama. Something okay, so maybe sometimes there's some cases like there's one story about the fly that was uh, attached to the caca in the back of the cow, and the cow went around. Actually, no, it didn't become enlightened, created the cause to become enlightened. 
That's right. So yes, correct. So if, to become enlightened, you have to be human. You know, you have to have the human body. So if there's no more humanity, then we have to go to another planet <laughs> to continue practicing Dharma. <laughs> so let's hope that doesn't happen. So we still have an opportunity now. So this is mainly one of the reasons I think it's very important to plant trees. And also it's, it's Dharma in action, you know, because you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for humanity, for all sentient beings on the planet, for the environment, because the, the planet is alive. We, the, you know, the ancients, they call it Pachamama. She's a mother, Gaia, right? The planet is alive. And, um, and the problem is that we don't want to adapt. We want nature to adapt to us. We force nature to adapt to us. And of course, that's what's happening. You know, we're destroying the environment and ourselves together because we don't want to adapt. So we have to find a, a middle way, right? We can adapt, but also create nature to adapt to us, but middle way. So I think the first step, planting trees, this could be a very beneficial way to start to also um reverse your carbon footprint because we all have a carbon footprint every day we're creating carbon footprint right so how to reverse that by planting trees i think that's the most effective way and also understanding about sustainable consumerism and all these concepts because we have an impact our lifestyle has an impact on the environment and we we have to be aware of that single use plastic for example how many plastic bottles do we throw every day on the planet? Anyways, it just goes on and on and on. But the thing is, is that you have to be positive and put into action, you know, like bodhicitta. Bodhicitta, you can sit down, meditate, oh, uh, oh all mother sentient beings, all mother sentient beings. But it's not enough. <laughs> you have to put it in action. You have to put it in action. You have to do it, not just think, right? If you're always just only thinking, not doing anything, then it's difficult to really have any results. So, going back to the attitude and perception. You change your perception, you change your attitude, you change your life. Really, that is what Dharma is telling us. Okay, In a simple way, form that we can use to apply in everyday life. So, what is the first step? Gratitude. Then to start to be aware of our mind. Not so much to control it, but to observe it. So we can't really control anything. It's, a, it's, a, it's an illusion. The, the concept of control is an illusion almost. We can flow. That we can do. <laughs> but control is, is very relative. It's relative. If you want to control something, you control your mind. That's not a bad idea. It's a good start. But that's very difficult. Very difficult. If you can stop thinking for one second, you can stop thinking for two seconds. Then you can stop thinking for three seconds, right? If you can stop thinking for 10 seconds, then you can stop thinking for one minute. Yes or no? Right? And if you do a little bit every day, a little bit every day, finally you will be able to do one minute without thinking. And then you start to hear the, the inner voice. This is a real voice. Not the mind of oh, all day from morning to night. <laughs> right? You get you can even get headache. And sometimes you can't go to you can't even can't fall asleep. It's too much thinking, too much thinking, too much thinking. So if you want to fall asleep, because the brain becomes very active with this screen. Screen. Screen activates the brain. And they create dopamine and we create addiction. This also I think is important to talk about. But then, so for example, we're very active, then we go to sleep, and we can't sleep, can't sleep, and then we get more stressed, more stressed, and then <laughs> turn around, right? <laughs> so what is, so that's why this, this meditation of stopping to think is very helpful for sleeping. So when, because when you go to sleep, you're not thinking. Automatically, the mind shuts down. You know, the subconscious mind gets, it, it, it kicks in. And there's a process when you're falling asleep, you can, and then there's one point where you don't remember anything and then suddenly you're in the dream, right? So in that point, if you can go through that point consciously, wow, right? So how to do that? 
slowly, slowly. You can do it before. You do maybe five minutes in the morning, gratitude meditation, and then to sleep. Before sleeping, you try to turn off the mind. At least if you can do one second, two seconds. Just try, you know? And the breathing. From here. Not the nose breathing. Not this one. This is the breathing we have when we are asleep. It kicks in automatically. But if we do it manually, we're already creating the cause for us to start to go into a different level of consciousness. So... From here, the breath. Not from here. Not this one. This one. So already, if you turn off the mind, you start breathing like that, already the body starts to relax. And then, boom, fall asleep. Very easy. Like that. But as we're falling asleep, it's a manual one. It's not an automatic falling asleep. Normally, we fall asleep automatically. Turn, turn, turn. Oh, 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 oh. Right? <laughs> But if we do it manually, already it is a great meditation. Great meditation. That's so easy, right? If you want to apply it, practically, you can start doing these two meditations in the morning and at night. Because all we, we, we like, to, if like, so I have some friends, they put TV and then they watch TV. Well, let's see, they program the TV to go off after half an hour or something like that. <laughs> I don't think this is very healthy. Especially for the mind, you know, because we all, we are, so the thing is that we're learning every day, right? That's why this uh, very famous uh, philosopher called Plato, he said, I know that I don't know anything. You know this guy, Plato? And they asked him, who told you that? He said, my wife. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> It's, it's a joke, it's a joke. No, but uh, it's true, you know, like when you know that you don't know anything, that's when you're learning. If you think I know everything, then, then you become ignorant. Because life is a process of learning. The day we die, we're learning about the process of death. So it's very arrogant to think, oh, I know, I'm very, you know, because everybody knows different things. You can't really compare the wisdom or the knowledge because each person has different perspective, different life, different experience. So obviously what we know is going to be different, right? So really comparing, if you're going to compare with others, always compare in order to improve, not to put yourself down because this is very typical. We do that. We, we really do it a lot and we don't even realize. So this, I think very important. This is the first number one attitude perception. We have to start to change, love ourselves, appreciate ourselves. Really, you know, give empower yourself. Don't give away your power. Take it and use it. We give our power to the TV, to the phone, to all the addictions of insatisfaction, you know, formless addictions, for, uh, materialistic addictions, you know, cons idealizations. How many times we idealize? All kinds of things. What is the problem with idealization? It's unrealistic. So we are setting ourselves up for disappointment. It will never be like you imagine, ever. It's always going to be different because it's life. <laughs> life is about improvisation, you know? So that's why flowing is very important. The moment you try to hold on, then you start to have problems because life is flowing. Life is moving. It's like a river, you know? If you try to start, stop, then in the end, you know, the river is going to take you anyways because that's life. Life is changing constantly. So if you're going to get attached to something, get attached to your improvement towards, you set a goal, right? And you get attached to that if you want. I mean, you can use it. You can use it. Or anger also, you can use it. It's not necessarily has to be destructive emotion. You can use anger with yourself. Or, oh, you know, I have to push myself. You know, like I'm not doing, you know, like you can use it, but not in a destructive way, not in an unproductive way, in a productive way. It's just an example. For some people, it works. For some people, it doesn't work. If people are very angry people, you use the anger for improving. Right? You use what you have. You use the tools that you have, but in a very wise way. You, know, you have to check the results. You check inside. Check. Check. Every day, you have to check all the time. Look, 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 look. If you don't do that, always looking outside, looking outside, looking at others, then you're, you're wasting your time.
eventually you're going to have to challenge yourself. Eventually you have to confront yourself. At some point in your life, you will have to do it whether you want or you don't. It doesn't matter. That's, that's the law of the universe. So the earlier you challenge and you confront yourself, the easier it will be later on. And also you start to see further away. You can see the horizon much further away because your mind starts to expand. So you start to see things differently. And I think that's very beautiful. That's really what Dharma is trying to help us with. But if we don't apply it, the guru is not going to take your hand and say, come, come, I, I'll take you to enlightenment. Don't worry. I, I wish, right? It would be so easy. We'll just be lying in bed all morning, all day like that. Oh, the guru will save me. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so anyways. <laughs> okay, you understood, right? Attitude perception. Okay, more quest questions? But related to this, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do we love ourselves without self-cherishing and self-grasping attitude? Ah, this is a good, very good question. Thank you. Very relevant. Okay, so first of all, we have to touch the base on, on the word love. Love is very misinterpreted and misused, that word. I love you if you're only with me. I love you if... Um, you dress the way I like, or I, I love you if, there's always an if, right? It's a condition. That's why they say conditional love, unconditional love. So really love, the true love is unconditional. You are happy for the other person. If the other person is happy, you're happy for them. But the, uh, the conditional love is not love, it's attachment. So many people will say, oh, you know why? Love brings suffering. That's not true. Love does not bring suffering. Attachment brings suffering. So you have to be able to differentiate between love and attachment. Just like the self-cherishing love. You need a little bit, a little bit of feeling good about yourself. You need to be a little bit proud so that you can, you know, we, are, we exist. You know, we are here. But not too much. Because then it becomes counterproductive. Then we don't see, we become blind. The pride blinds us. Nobody can say anything to you. Who are your true friends? The one who criticize you in front of you and talk really good about you behind your back. This is a true friend. Right? So many people, they in front of you, they don't say anything. And then behind you, they pa 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 criticizing a lot. Right? This is not a true friend. But why sometimes, even if you have true friends and they won't criticize you, I'm talking about constructive criticism, huh? <laughs> Don't get me confused. So, you know, sometimes we have friends and they try to tell us things, but we are so proud that we don't want to listen and then we get angry at them and maybe friendship finish. So this also is not healthy, right? We have to be open enough and humble enough to be able to take criticism. And not just listen, uh -huh, uh -huh, but inside thinking, oh, no, I don't, I don't, you know, no. We're saying, okay, okay, but inside, no. Not like that. Actually listening. Communic which is the main aspect of communication? listening right and not listening to answer but listening to understand that's really the base of communication if you can't listen to understand then it's very difficult to have communication so anyways i got lost now <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah, so sometimes we're scared to criticize our friends because we may lose the friendship. So you also have to be skillful. You have to understand the person. You have to know what kind of person you're talking to. Some people, they don't mind criticism. Some people, for them, it's a big deal, huge deal. Why? Perception and attitude. That's it. So me, I love criticism. Constructive, I always ask, please, constructive, please say what you think, please express, because it helps me to improve. It helps me to see things that I cannot see from my perspective. You know, maybe I have an attitude, or have a way of doing things. Maybe people don't like, but if they don't tell me, how can I know? I'm not clairvoyant. I can't read your mind, right? So I would like people to talk to me in a clear, clean, clear way with love, right? And because... That's what I would like to receive, then that's what I give. So for me, I always say what I think, only if it's productive and it doesn't harm. 
Because for some people, it can be very harmful. You have to, I made that mistake sometimes before in the past. I was not skillful enough. And then people become, you know, con the counterproductive. They don't want to listen anymore. They shut down, they close. So then you are not able to help your friend. On the contrary, you created an obstacle to the friendship. So you can't generalize, obviously, you know, each of us is different. So really we have to check and uh, apply with the circumstance and re in relation to that moment, to that person, to like, we really have to be very specific. Generalizing is very easy, you know, oh, one bad thing happened, oh, everybody's bad. <laughs> Sometimes it happens, you no, know? you just start to generalize, Your, our mind is like that, you know, <laughs> then so then we have to go back, be more specific, try to understand from, from the actual point of view of the other person. right? Because obviously not everybody's going to have our perspective. So we also have to put ourselves in the shoes of the other person. That's called empathy. right? Empathy is, is the beginning of compassion and bodhicitta. It's not that, but it's the beginning. right? It's first steps, baby steps, empathy. And um, so, going back to your question, how do you recognize or how do you not confuse self-cherishing with love, right? So it's our gut feeling we know. Because which is the number one brain? Where is the number one brain? Here, the stomach. Number two brain, the heart. Number three brain, here. But where do we make all our decisions? From here. And here, here, nothing. <laughs> so there's a disconnect. Right, so really, you have, why do you say, oh, your gut instinct? Why is this coming from very ancient? It's word, right? Gut, why, why, why? Because here is where you really should make the decisions. Here, and then here you feel it, and then the intellectual aspect kicks in and says, okay, try to kind of relate to the reality, to society. You know, we have to have a way to relate. You know, because so that's the logic, right? But you can't always follow this. Because the mind is very relative. According to your emotion, it's going to change. If you're angry, you're going to see it in a different light than if you're very happy or not. Yeah? When you're angry, you see things differently. Right? And you do things and you say things very differently. So, anyways. More questions? Yes. Mm-hmm. How, how do you go about with dealing with one's own anger? Because um, we can say that we can use anger to channel uh, ourselves, to motivate ourselves. But uh, sometimes anger can be destructive. Oh, yeah. And sometimes um, at the split moment, we cannot control. We let out some angry words or we meet the people that we love uh, yeah. sad. So do you have any tips that you can provide which uh, me as a layman or us as a layman, lay person can learn from? Yeah. Okay, so the first thing, very, 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 very important. The, you know, the Sufis, the Sufis. Sufism is a branch of the Islam and they have very wise sayings. All the religions have, I mean, they have a golden rule, right? It's, it's the same base. So there's one saying, they say, opportunities are like an arrow. Once you shoot, it's not going back, like a word said without thinking. It's beautiful, no? You can never take back a word you say. So that's, it's one of the things like in a relationship, when you lose respect for the person, when you say harsh words, you can never go back again. You lost that forever, in a way. Even if you make friends, oh, I'm sorry, da 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 da, -da. It already happened. You already had that disconnect, right? You can never go back on that. So it's very, very important to always apply that to yourself so that you can apply that to others. The moment you lose respect for yourself, then you, you, you lose the respect for the others. So mainly anger, what is anger? Anger is suffering for the actions of somebody else or suffering, suffering because of something well i'm okay with <laughs> rephrase <laughs> because i remember the phrase but then i can't put it together anyways i'll put i'll go somewhere else so it's like for example for example i'll give lama yeshe's example i like this one so for example at the middle of the night 
at 3 a.m., if somebody comes to your house and knocking on your door, what do you do? You're very suspicious, right? Who are you? You don't know the person, so you probably won't even open the door. If a family member comes at 3 a.m., maybe you open the door a little bit and you're like, what do you want? What's going on? You know, like, you're still suspicious. Like, why are you here? You know, you're like, not really, open. oh, yeah, open, come, have tea. At 3 a.m., you're sleeping, you know? It's like, what's going on? You know, maybe he's drunk, made some problem, something, you know, you already start projecting. But then, for example, when anger comes, what do we do? We open the door, we offer the anger, our body completely, the house, it's your house, you want to burn down the house, burn down the house. We offer tea to anger. Anger is like a stranger. It's not really, you know, it's something we invite. You know, so why would you be suspicious of a family member at 3 a.m., but when anger comes, you give him full power? If you think like that, then you start to maybe change a little bit this aspect. And also always be aware that once you say something, you can never take it back. I mean, regret is okay, but too much regret is not good. If we make mistakes, it's good. If we don't mis make mistakes, it means you're not doing anything. <laughs> right? So making mistakes is very important. If you're making mistakes, it's good. It means you're doing something. But if you repeat the same mistakes again, ah, uh, this is a problem. You're not learning from your mistakes. So it's good to make mistakes, but to learn and avoid them in the future. You know? If we don't make mistakes, we're not doing anything. If we make the same mistakes, then we again, you know, so always check. You have a question? No. Okay, sorry, sorry. No, because I did it like that. I thought maybe you had a question. So um, this is the important part to understand why we give full power to anger. And then anger will destroy a lot of beautiful things that we created. You know, things that maybe we built, like actually the, the beautiful things that take a lot, lot of time to, to create. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of work, a lot of dedication to destroy. In one second, you can destroy, you know. And also, that's also one of the reasons, you know, why in the newspaper, this negativity is very, it's given a lot of importance, you know, they give a lot of importance to negativity. But actually, positivity is much more important, right? So, for example, I, like an example, a mother who raises her children, right? Single mother, working two, three shifts, takes her children to university for 20 years. Do you think she'll make headlines? No. But a mother who killed her son in one second of anger, headlines, all the newspapers. Why? It took one second, but that is so important. But the woman who was for 20 years dedicating her life for those children, why don't we give a value to that in the newspaper, for example? This is something we have to understand society anyway they program us to overvalue negativity much more than positivity and again going back to the example of the white wolf and the black wolf it's a choice what do we want to prevail prevail in our life positivity or negativity obviously positivity because that's really gonna help us not to be unhappy to be more productive you know so all these things are really things that we have to think i mean i can talk about it but if you don't apply it, if you don't work on it, if you don't check, then it's not really useful, right? It's like a bulb without electricity. You know, the bulb is like the Dharma, but we are the electricity. Without the Dharma, just the electricity, there's no light, right? With the bulb without electricity, also no light. But you put the bulb with the electricity together, ah, then light is coming. So you have to complement the two complementary aspects put together. Okay, um, did that answer your question about anger? Yeah, okay. If you have questions, you let me know. You can interrupt me anytime you want. Also, there's a question on YouTube. Um, any advice for the modern corporate worker 
who struggle to balance his life and aspiration to attain enlightenment. Okay, this is actually a very relevant question for today. So work. Anybody know who Alan Watts is? Alan Watts is a is an interesting guy. I like his philosophy. So one of the things he says is the key is to enjoy work. <laughs> Again, we're talking about attitude and perception, right? What is one of the luckiest things is to enjoy your work, but that's an option also. You know, like you can actually enjoy anything if you have the right attitude and perception. So really, it's about. I don't really like to use the word mindful, but in this case, I'm going to use it because mindfulness is being used too much. You know, mindfulness, but it is relevant in this case. So you have to be mindful. You know of what you're doing. The moment you become a little bit mindful, then you start to enjoy. Right? Yes or no? You sure? <laughs> Who enjoys work? I don't think anybody enjoys work. You enjoy work. Oh, you're so lucky. So lucky. And can you explain to us why you enjoy your work? Did you you chose your work? I just like what I'm doing so uh, whatever I do I put my very sincere heart so even sometimes when we mm -hmm. improve myself Good. Yeah. so so you always enjoy the work or yeah. always whichever work doesn't matter yeah that's it that's the key Alan Watts was talking about that you know that's important aspect of our life because we don't live to work, we work to live. <laughs> it's a big difference. You know, we're educated to work, but we have to learn how to live. Nobody really educates us how to live. So we have to make a difference there, you know? And um, yeah, if you anything you do, it's all about how you see it. So I'm not going to repeat again and again, but sometimes it's important, you know, because you have to, I have to, get it inside <laughs> so anyways if you, if you get bored you let me know but I will keep repeating anyways <laughs> but that's really I think it's an important aspect so when you when you become more mindful and more present then you start to enjoy things it's like meditation you can do meditation while you're working as well you can meditate any time of the day doing anything even if you're in the bathroom you can meditate also it's not disrespectful to meditate in the bathroom. You know, it's just a process of life. So any situation you can apply meditation, always. And if you start to do that in work, then it's going to start transforming. Also, if you are happy, if you feel good, then also the other people around you also feel better. This is also something I think I should talk about. It's called, I give it a name, I call it the energetic snowball sounds good no <laughs> you know it's snowball snowball here i don't think you have snow but the concept of the snowball is like first a small ball like that on the top of the hill and then you throw it it starts becoming bigger 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 and at the end it can destroy a whole house right how big but it started how they start small you know so the inertia big 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 and then if it hits a house it can destroy it completely so the energetic snowball, it happens a lot at work because people are stressed, they're unhappy, they're angry, they are frustrated. And then what do they do? Energetic vomiting. You know? And then what happens? If you also are not doing so well, you're unhappy, you're frustrated, you're then also you explode also. Then two people, right? And then one person says something, and the other person and become bigger, 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 bigger. And then everybody starts to get involved, take sides, whatever. Why is that? Because each person is only thinking about them. They're not really seeing the other person. They're only saying me, big me. So how to switch that? For example, if the, somebody comes to the work and they're very angry and shouting and frustrated and maybe talking bad to you and insulting you, what is the first thing you do? Me, right? Oh, they insulted me. Then what do we do? We react. We condition. 
So which is the key? Is first thing you have to do? When you see somebody angry, shouting at you, sending you all this bad energy, frequency, whatever, instead of being like me, you say, ah, them. They must be suffering so much in order to, to speak like that or to treat others like that. Inside, there must be so much suffering. So immediately, your attitude changed. Suddenly, you feel compassion. You feel love. You feel caring for them. You don't want to hurt them. And then your words, when you, when you answer, it will be different. Because you're not taking it personally. Right? You disconnect from this ego concept. Why? Because you are thinking about the other person. That's why gratitude, empathy, you're touching these two things already, very, very useful for a productive life, for a life with not unhappiness, you know, a more happy, harmonious. Because what is the most important? Harmony. Inner harmony, outside harmony. But it's it's not about sacrificing things, you know, for that harmony, you know. It has to come naturally. You can't force it. You know, all the best, the most important things in life we can't see. It has no color, it has no shape. Like the love of a mother. The most important things in life you cannot buy with money. You cannot see, you cannot touch. Think about that. Mm. So that's it. This energetic snowball. How to change? By right? seeing. So every time somebody says harsh words to you, think about them. Don't identify. Don't take it personally. Because it's not about you. You're not the center of the universe. You're not. <laughs> we think we are. And that's why we take it so seriously. And that's why we suffer so much. Me. Big me equals big suffering. Small me equals small suffering. It's logical, right? <laughs> yeah. What what time is it? Now it's nine zero nine. Now okay. Okay, still have some time. <laughs> but uh, if you want me to change subject, if you have a question, you just let me know. Okay, please. This is a discussion group. Yes. Mm. Not being passive aggressive, maybe passive aggressive. Yeah. What's, what does it mean? Conniving. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it's not as it's not simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. So in that case. In that case, what is your attitude towards those people? They're probably jealous of you. And that's why they're putting you in that situation. You know, if 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 those people, they're doing that, instead of saying me, oh, they're doing this to me, you have to think, why are they doing it? And they're probably doing it because they're jealous. So then you have compassion. And what does that mean? It means you're doing good. It's a good sign, actually, that you are successful. This is what we want. We want to be successful, right? In the financial world, whatever. Inside here, maybe not so much. <laughs> but you have to have the balance. You know, you, you need some money to be able to eat, to have a good life, to, you know, to be able to also offer. But if you have too much, then it becomes a lot of suffering. Because then you want more, and then you people can steal, you can lose, and, da, 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 and just, you spend so much time worrying. And worrying is really counterproductive. Just give me one good result that worrying gives you. Difficult, no? There's not, not much result in worrying. And we worry a lot. Why? Because of fear. Because of insecurity. Because of attachment. You know, thinking about the past. Thinking about the future. Thinking about what are, what are people going to think about me. If I give more importance of what people are going to think about me, I'm not gonna really going to live my life. I'm going to live their life. Right? <laughs> and it's really about living your life. Right? So you can benefit others. First, you improve yourself and then you can benefit others. What is life really about? It's about sharing, sharing and caring. And um, we share everything we share the space, we share the air, 
right? We're sharing everything. Right now we're sharing the space in here. We're sharing the same oxygen. We're sharing so many things all the time, you know? All the time we're sharing interdependence. It's very easy to think, oh, I, I exist by myself. But actually we only exist because we depend on so many circumstances. Like the circumstances of our great-great-grandparents meeting our great-great-grandmother. That circumstance is part of our existence. So it's interdependence. In order to exist, we depend on infinite, countless causes. So anyways, does that make sense? Yeah? It's it's really, you just have to apply it to the circumstance, but it's really, it's a universal thing. You know, it, it's just a question of slowly, slowly changing your mind. That's really what we're trying to, to be able to do. It's called, it's mind science. You know, the Buddha Shakyamuni was already teaching that 2,500 years ago. Today, the scientists are like, wow, we discovered quantum physics, neuroscience, you know. But actually, <laughs> already 2,500 years ago, they already knew that, you know, because by sitting down and meditating. Isn't that amazing? The scientists, they still don't understand. How can you understand what we understood through all the science, all the investigation, da, 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 just by sitting like that? <laughs> But it's true, it coincides, you know, and that's, I think it's so amazing when His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he organizes, you know, the, the discussion, the panels, the groups, you know, the, of phys quantum physicists talking with the doctorates in, of uh, emptiness, the Buddhist philosophy. And that is so, and they're always on the same page. That's amazing. That's why I really feel we're in a golden age now. You know, we can think all oh, very negatively or we can think very positively. And I think it's very positive. Right now, I think there has never been as many opportunities as today in the history of humankind. Of course, there's a lot of misinformation. That's why we also have to filter. It's important to filter. There's too much information. Too much information, too much misinformation. That's one of the things. But we can manage, I think. We can manage. Okay. No more questions? I'm going to continue. Okay, please. But maybe can you pass the microphone? I can't hear very well. Hi. Um, <clears throat> what should be a general guide to how much time we should put to um uh, this life material concerns, and then how much time should we put towards dharma for future lives? But every moment can be dharma if you want. It's it's not it's you don't have to force yourself, you know. You really don't have to force yourself. Because then it becomes counterproductive. You have to enjoy it. You have to enjoy it. Then it becomes so productive. Really. <laughs> you force yourself, then it's maybe it's not the right thing for you. Just like each person has to find the medicine by looking at the cause. But sometimes you don't even need the medicine if you can find the cause and er eradicate the cause. Right? If you take away the cause of the illness, the illness will disappear. So not always do you need the medicine. Sometimes you just have to find the cause for that result. So, for example, you're asking me how how long should I dedicate to meditation or practice and how long not? Is that what you're... Um, so like learning about Dharma... Um, Ex yes, expanding, uh, putting the time. To oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. One more, one more is totally opposite. One more is. Well, I think the moment you stop enjoying, then not so much. But as long as you enjoy, then keep going. Right? You, you open a book and you start reading. Oh, oh, oh I like it. Why well, enjoy? You continue reading. The moment you, mm, let me, you can close, give some space, pick it up later, at another time. Right. But if you force, 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 what's going to happen? You're going to get frustrated. And then you're going to have a rejection towards that, an aversion. And we don't want to have that, right? We want to be able to enjoy that. You know? And many times that's the thing. You know, we, we have this concept that we have to force ourselves. We have to push ourselves. And if we don't do that, we won't be successful. 
right? We that's a concept that we have, you know. I'm not talking about procrastination. Okay, it's, I'm talking about the balance. The extremes are not healthy. The extremes really are gonna create problems in your life. For example, water. You can have a glass of water, it's okay, but too much water then makes tsunami, right? <laughs> so extremes, even if it's completely harmless, in extreme it can be harmful. You know, so it's you don't want to saturate yourself. You want to be able to enjoy it. At least that's from my perspective. Some people need to be saturated. Some people enjoy that. You know, they enjoy getting saturated and the intellectual, you know, mind sharpening and pushing, pushing. Some people it works. Right? You know, you just have to see, uh, identify what works for you. Nobody can really identify that for you. And that's why making mistakes is okay because you're trying, trying, trying. What happens in the education system sometimes? They make us scared of making mistakes. And then we lose creativity. And being creative is beautiful. So don't be scared of making mistakes. That's really the way to learn. That's the best way to learn for humans. We humans, we learn with mistakes a lot. But be careful because some, some mistakes are irre irreversible. So you have to be careful also. You, know, you can make mistakes. You can risk, but not too much. Balancing in the band. Lam Rim is talking about the middle way, the middle path. And so really, in the end, you have to check yourself. You sit down and you think about it. You think, what do I want? What I don't want? Right? Do we know what we don't want? Not always. Because many times we want to be happy, but we create the cause to be super unhappy by searching for happiness. Right? So that's because we're not really sitting down and thinking about how are we going to become happy. We set ourselves up to disappointment, you know, because we are projecting, 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 and what we what what we see there is never what actually is there. You know, for example, I can look at the cup, and what what is happening? The cup is one thing. And then it has to go through the information, right? The information, the, the, the light comes, it bounces, the color, and then the color arrives in my eye. And then the eye actually sees it upside down. Everything's upside down for the eyes, upside down. And then the brain puts it back in, in the like normal form, right? So it's first interpretation of the eye, second interpretation of our mind, then third interpretation of what we project on that. So and you, we still think the cup, as we see it, as we project it, is really the reality of what is there. Isn't that a little bit ridiculous to think that everything we see is like that? You know, we believe it so so much, like as if it's solid, it's real, and we follow our mind follows that, and then we suffer because it doesn't coincide. Our projections are not the reality, but we believe it. So then there's a conflict, inner conflict. And then we can't identify why we have the inner conflict. You know, it's so subtle, so subconscious that we don't understand why, but there's something, something is wrong. You know, and this with this situations happen a lot, every in many different circumstances, different aspects, you know. But that's why meditation is not only about sitting down. I mean, you can meditate lying down if you want. You don't have to sit down. Like the Buddha, oh, for one hour, I cannot move. If I move, then I'm not a great meditator. I'm not really meditating for real. You know, it's it's not about that. If you feel comfortable, then you can do like that. If you want to lie down, you lie down. You know, of course, you probably fall asleep. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyways. Does it make sense? Yeah? Please. Yeah. Um, because I just worry if I keep doing what I enjoy, then when that time comes, I just worry that that time I may regret not putting the time to more towards Buddhism, Dharma. It's a good technique. It's a good technique. <laughs> fear. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, fear, actually, you have to be careful with fear. I mean, you can use fear, but not too much. You know, if you make decisions based on fear, sometimes they're not the right decisions. You know. So, yeah, it's relative also. You have to see it for yourself, you know. But if you do today, you worry for today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Because what you have now is today. So if you don't do it, I mean, if 
regret is sometimes counterproductive. In Tibetan, they say, there's one saying is like, why regret what you can't change? Right? If you can't change it, then why? What's what's the use of putting so much attention, energy, time, and space on something like that, which you cannot really change? I mean, if you have enough regret in order not to make the same mistake again, then yes, it's productive, right? But not too much. Otherwise, we 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 suffer too much, and then it creates problems, right? Okay, so I'm gonna continue. I think maybe you had a question, yeah. Can you pass the microphone to her? Thank you, Lamala. Can you have a seat there? <laughs> Lamala, you. Uh, kindly share your inspiration um, where there's difficult situations in your life, examples, where your gut feel and your mind are not aligned and mm -hmm. how do you overcome it? It takes time. You just have to give time to time and give yourself space. Those are the two key. You know, sometimes we're very impatient. We want it, the answer now. We want the result now. And then we never get the result because we're forcing, we're pushing, you know, and uh, stressing, you know, like, so it sometimes gives space, give time, and then it will come. That's many times happens in a relationship, for example. We want to change the other person or we want to change ourselves. And then we, that it's very difficult to change ourselves or change somebody else. But how is it we give space and with that space the change occurs? Right? So in that aspect it's it's pretty does that answer your question? Yeah? I think behind you had the question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Taken. Mm -hmm. uh, you just now told us that the more life mm -hmm. you cannot see, you mm -hmm. cannot touch. Yeah. Now, please excuse my ignorance. What are they? The oh. yeah, it's an example, but. Mm -hmm. Is uh, what do you consider human being mm -hmm. in the twenty first century? Wow, I like Two that. Things. The second question is the first That's question, all. maybe. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you're putting me in a situation now. <laughs> I'm going to need some help. Okay, volunteers, please. What is very important in life that you cannot see and touch? I will say the first one: the the love of a mother. What else? Ideas, come on. Be creative. Hmm? Trust. Very good. What else? Very good. What else? Sorry? What? Hope, hope, friendship. There's so many things like that. It just goes on and on and on. And we, the more you say, the more we're going to get of that. And none of these things you can buy with money either. Interesting, no? If you think about it, you'll start to find more and more and more and more and more. Yeah. But you have to think about it. I can't always give you the answer. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know the answer. So I, I discovered the answer also in the process. And the second question about being a good human. So this is very relative also. I mean, you can generalize, right? There's a general aspect of what a good person is. But if you actually delve down, for example, okay, if, if I have a friend who's a masochist, you know, a masochist, you know, masochist. So what is a pleasure for a masochist? Pain. But can you can't apply that to everybody, right? <laughs> Not everybody is a masochist. So really, you have to also think, okay, the normal way is to think, okay, how I would like to be treated, what I would like to receive. This is what you give. Of course, if you're a masochist, you have to change a little bit the equation. <laughs> Not everybody's a masochist. But I mean, we are a little bit masochist sometimes. We, we, we like to suffer. We do, actually. We don't realize, but we like to suffer. We're addicted to suffering, in a way. If you check, you will, you will realize. 
Why do we overvalue negativity so much? Because we like to suffer. We like to, you know, why is the news so interesting? Why is, because always all these bad things happening to other people and then, well, I'm okay. All these bad things happening to other people, you know, so you put attention to there and then you forget about your problems, right? But that's not really good method, actually. You know, you're just giving a lot of importance to things that you don't want to give importance to, really. If you if you give importance to negative things, is to learn to w know what you, what you want to give, what you what you want to receive, what you don't want to give, what you don't want to receive, right? So you have to apply that attitude. You give what you want to receive, according to the person, right? And you apply that to yourself. So it's not about giving, 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 and then suddenly you don't exist. That happens. I know people like that. And I try to tell them, hey, think think for yourself too, you know, think about yourself too, but they, they don't want to. But that's another extreme. It's also an unhealthy extreme, but not for everybody, of course, for Lama Sabara Munji, it's very different. Lama Sabara Munji, he's an enlightened being. So we can't really <laughs> think like that. For Rinpoche, he, that's not really extreme, right? That's just his way of being, you know? And uh, if we try to have the lifestyle of Lama Sopa, I think personally me, I I, I wouldn't survive. He uh, he didn't li he wouldn't lie down. Lama Sopa Rinpoche, he didn't even lie down. Can you believe that? Like maybe in thirty years he lied down twice, like literally lying down. That's insane. That's that's superhuman. So I mean, of course, it's very it's huge inspiration, but we can't expect to be like that ourselves. Um, because you you do need to have certain realizations, you know. Otherwise, the body just shuts down completely, you know. So, but um, it's just an example, right? And um, so you dedicate time to your for yourself, and you treat yourself with kindness. You treat yourself with respect. You have patience with yourself, and all of these good things. And then you apply that, and you offer that to others how you want to receive. That for me is maybe a good example to start with. Because really, Dharma, if you're a Christian, if you're Muslim, if you're Hindu, Dharma helps you to be a better Hindu, better Muslim. You know, And if you study, if you learn about the Quran and if you study about the Bible, there's many things that coincide also with the Dharma because the base is the same. It's the golden rule. Right? So it's it's not about me, our, you know, like we have that concept, me first, then my family, then my country, my planet, my galaxy, <laughs> the Milky Way, my galaxy, <laughs> right? We do have that, that concept. But if you check, where is the borders, the frontiers? It's invisible. There's nothing. There's no, there's, it's just an invention. Also money is created. It's an invention. If there's no food, there's no water, you think people are going to value money? No, they'll probably use it to make fire to keep warm. That's it. Because when there's no food, there's no water, money loses all its value. So the value of the money is, is a concept. It's a, we, have, we put the value. It's a fantasy, actually. You know, the homo sapiens, we have that tendency to believe in the fantasy, and then it unites us. So for example, 200,000 people will go and give up their life in a war for a country. It's a belief. But those 200 people, they don't know each other. The the country, the frontiers, is just imaginary. And they're fighting a war of some greedy people. And they're giving up their life. But of course, the concept, my country, I'm a patriot, you know, I'm, wow, wow. All the wars, have always been created as a business, you know, which is a very sad aspect. I you know, and I think I'm not hundred percent sure, but I, I, I think number one business in the world is war, creation of weapons and war, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's it's big business. Anyways. Okay. Okay, I continue, yeah? Are you bored? Tired? Do you want a break? No? Good? Everything good? Okay.
Actually, I already talked about everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one thing I wanted to talk about is very interesting because I have a son, right? He's six years old now. And I learned so much from him. We think, you know, we think we have to educate the children. No, the children have to educate us, actually. We have so much to learn from them because we forgot how we were when we were children. We forgot. So, of course, children need a limit, limit limits. Have, we have to put the limits. If a child does have no limit, it's like being blindfolded, trying to search for a wall. There's no wall, there's no wall, there's no wall. Wow, it's so much, so difficult, no? But if you're blindfolded and then you, you walk, oh, there's a wall here, and then you walk, oh, there's a wall here, and you recognize there's a wall, then you feel secure. This is an example of the education for children, you know, like putting the limits, right? You put the limits for them to feel that security, that area, they know which is the limit, right? But for example, uh, with my son, many times I say, I, I mean, I don't say, don't do this, because I say so. He won't listen. He'll be like, well, I don't care. What, what you say? Who cares? You know, he's a rebel like me. You know, I think it's good to be a little bit rebellious. It's good. Actually, there, there's an educator, you know, a psychologist for children. You know, they say, if your son or daughter does not listen the first time, that's a very good sign you're doing the right thing. <laughs> it's funny, huh? If your children don't listen to you the first or second time, you, you have to repeat, that's very healthy because they're questioning everything. They're questioning. If you say something they do immediately, then it's it's not that a good sign. You know, it means they're complacent. They're like, but actually education is trying to do that. That's what it does. You know, it puts us in a box and we are universal. We're infinite. We don't really have that limit, but we limit ourselves because we don't believe in ourselves. We don't believe in our potential. We are scared of that potential. So we really have to change that. That's, we have to turn around like the omelette. Turn around the omelette. <laughs> it's a Spanish thing. And um, so we all were children, but we forgot. I remember when I was a child, I have very good memory from my, my childhood. But I always used to think I'd never want to be an adult. I used to think, oh, it must be so problematic to be an adult. Always worrying, always this, always that. I'm so happy to be a child. I have no problems. You know, I don't have, I, don't, I didn't understand why adults suffer so much mentally. I really didn't understand. So I didn't want to be an adult. I'm like, I, I never want to be an adult because look at them. <laughs> right? And now I'm the adult <laughs> and I'm looking at my son and I'm like, okay, <laughs> things have switched a bit, you know? And I realized my mind is very problematic. I create so many problems for my life, for, for myself, for the people around me. I'll give you an example right now. Just to put on this tuba, <laughs> I wanted to wear a normal t-shirt. And Geshe and I said, no, you should wear the tuba. It's good. It's respectful. No, so I said, okay. But uh, in my mind, I'm like, I don't want to because it's, you know, it's just the way I'm programmed. I'm a rebel. If somebody says, do this, I'm going to do something else completely. And my son is like that. And that's called reverse psychology. So, for example, if I want him to eat vegetables, it works. I tell you, I put all the vegetables on my plate. And I'm like, mm, I'm eating. And he's like, why don't I have vegetables? I'm like, oh, no, no, it's not for you. You won't like it. It's not. It's only for adults. You, you know, it's not for you. You just eat your rice. No, I want the vegetables. I, I, I will like it. No, 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 no. You won't like it. You won't. Yes, I will. And then he, he get aggressive. Give me the vegetables. And then he eat the vegetable. Mm, you see, I like it. Mm, 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 mm. You see, I like. It. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to force. I didn't have to push. I didn't have to insist. It's called reverse psychology. It's very useful. It works very well. So Gisela, he did reverse psychology on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. But um, yeah, so our mind works like that. This is something we have to recognize. Our mind can have a lot of aversion, can be very negative, can be pro very problematic in that sense. And that's why I say don't always follow your mind. Don't always believe what you think. Because thoughts are like clouds. They come and go. When you go to grab, there's nothing there. Even though 
thoughts can be very powerful because the thoughts, everything, for example, that's been manipulated by the human started with a thought. So if you see the, which is the name of the new skyscraper in Kuala Lumpur, the one that's competing with uh, with the uh, what's uh, Dubai or something. What's it called? You know this one, right? PAP. Okay. Wait, anyways, that you you know which building, right? <laughs> yeah. So that was created originally by a thought. It started with a thought, right? Somebody had to think, and then start to design, and then talk. so every the thoughts are very powerful. The results. If you think, oh, I want to, I want to reach certain state of mind where it can be a benefit to others. That thought can have a huge result. Okay, so you have to be able also to differentiate which which thoughts are productive, which thoughts are yours, and which thoughts are from influence. Many thoughts we think are ours are actually influenced by outside, but we think it's ours. So also, this you have to investigate. Is it really your thoughts? There's a lot of mind pollution going all over the place all the time, right? So, anyways, I'm not going to go into that because that's not really that's not really my thing. <laughs> yeah. Also, uh, um, there are some questions on YouTube. Can oh, I ask? okay, YouTube. The okay, okay. Okay. I didn't understand before when you said YouTube. Okay, okay. let's start with the mm. first one. Okay. What do you think about telling white lies? My life. Ah, that's a good question. Well, it depends. It depends, you know? If it's beneficial, if it avoids people from becoming very destructive. But always, so this, okay, <clears throat> let's talk about karma. What is the most important factor of car for karma? Anybody know? What is the most important aspect of karma? Ah, very good. You did your homework, huh? <laughs> Intention. So the intention is so important. The action can be the same. But if the intention is different, the karma result will be different. Do you want an example? Or can you think of an example? Anybody? Have an example? Different intention, same action, different result karmically. What? Okay, I'll give you an example. Um... This is, I don't know, it's not a very good example, but it's right now is the only example. <laughs> okay, let's say your friend is drunk. You went out to party and your friend is completely drunk and he wants to drive. He got the keys and he's going to drive. And you try to convince him there's no way you can convince him not to drive. And then, so you punch him in the face and take the keys. Right? You save his life. Maybe somebody, the pedestrian's life, who knows, right? The intention, where what was the intention? To help your friend, to save him, right? To avoid him having a very difficult situation. But then another same action, somebody maybe is jealous or is angry, somebody or they're suffering and they want to put down somebody or they want to get out the frustration, vent out this anger, you know? So then they punch somebody with the intention of humiliating them, of making them suffer. So what happened? The action is exactly the same, but the karmic result is completely different. Does it make sense? So that's why you always have to check the intention. What was the question again? White lies, right? <clears throat> so the intention is not so much about the action. I mean, we have the three doors, right? Thought, uh, verbal, and uh, action, right? Three doors. But of course, what is the most important aspect is the intention. Why? Why are we doing it? So even though maybe we have intention, we think maybe sometimes even we convince ourselves our intention is good. You know, do you understand this? This is also we do white lies to ourselves. No, it's true. The, we lie to ourselves more than anybody else. Actually, to tell the truth is we are lying to ourselves every day. It's just we don't want to recognize it. So white lies to ourselves. Huh? No, I'm doing good. <laughs> um, when we're not, actually, sometimes we're not doing good, but we try to convince. Like, there's many things like that. Oh, I'm a good person. I'm Buddhist. This, I think, this is a great example. I'm going to use the example. Many people say, "Oh, I'm a good person. Why? Because I'm a Buddhist." 
So then I'm a good person. That's a white lie. Right? It's not about the label of Buddhist. It's about your attitude and how you relate to people, how you treat people. Right? That's I mean, you can be Buddhist, but if you treat somebody badly, then that's not, that doesn't coincide, you know? So you can convince yourself you're a good person because you're Buddhist, but that doesn't make you a good person. So that could be a white lie. There's many things like that, you know? So always to check. But um, white lies, if you're going to avoid somebody hurting themselves or really suffering a lot, counterproductive result. The intention is positive to benefit and to help improve their life. Then the white lie is okay. I've I've said white lies sometimes because it's necessary. Sometimes it's necessary. Not normally, yeah, it's not. But sometimes you have these situations where it's better to to lie than to say the truth. Because some people don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to know the truth. Maybe they're not ready. Maybe they need more time. You know, so you have to also be, you know, skillful in that sense. Okay. Uh, the second question um, is a little bit unclear. It's something about listening and jumping to wrong conclusion conclusions or negative conclusion. Yeah, many times our emotional state of mind will push us towards the conclusion. That's why, you know, in the Vipassana, you know, uh, Gautama Buddha he used, to, he used to do a lot of Vipassanas, you know. And in Sanskrit, what is it? Um, anisha. Anisha means uh, equanimity. Anisha, right, in Sanskrit. So equanimity is very important. Very important, right? So what was the question again? Can you ask? Um, jumping to wrong conclusion, yeah. negative conclusion. Yeah. So that's why it's good to be equanimous, not to go one side or the other side, you know, because this is one of the problems we have. This is very clear. Buddha was talking about that already 2,500 years ago. We have a, there's an object, right? So if it's an object of desire, then we are grasping. If it's something we don't like, then we have a rejection. And then the third aspect is indifference. We don't care. So those, that's not being equanimous, right? So when we react towards what, uh, the reality, we are conditioning that. And we have mountains of conditioning in our life from previous lives and from this life. So through the practice of equanimity, we can slowly, slowly start to clear out these conditionings. Because the reacting is, is an important aspect of conditioning, right? So what was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> I didn't really want to get there. I think it's... um The question is about jumping to wrong conclusion. Yeah. So I think in that Perhaps aspect... It's maybe how we handle a person who jumps. That's why it's based on the state of mind. If you have a very negative state of mind that day, your conclusions will be negative probably. You'll probably jump towards that because we're influenced by the state of, the, of mind. But if that day we're very joyful, very happy like that, then we'll probably jump to a positive conclusion. So that's why equanimity is very important. Try not to react. Right? If you have to judge, judge yourself. Compare yourself yesterday. No, we can't really judge other people. We don't know, we don't really know ourselves in order to judge somebody else. But we are judging everybody all the time. <laughs> and uh do we judge ourselves? Not so much. Sometimes to be harsh with us, to put ourselves down, then yes. You know, but so it's really it's it's about equanimity is a huge tool that is available to us. It takes time. Slowly, slowly. Baby steps. You can't expect to build the roof of a house if you haven't built the foundation. It doesn't there's no logic to that, right? How can you build the roof if there's no foundation? You don't even have walls to put the roof on. So you start with the foundation. So for example, you can try to be equanimous a little bit when something affects you. You know, when you get the emotion, it starts coming up, yeah? That's when you apply. It's very easy to sit in your cave or wherever and meditate, you know? 
But then when you have a family and the wife is shouting here and the children is shouting there and then you're tired, you're frustrated, you're hungry, and da, 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 da. that's the moment when you put in practice Dharma. Right there. Not when you're happy, everything is okay, you're watching TV. Ah, oh, I love you. I love you too. Oh, now I'm going to practice Dharma. <laughs> the result is not going to be so productive you know really like when you're stressed when you're unhappy when you're suffering boom that's where you apply it happened to me one time when the mother of my son was giving birth she was giving birth so i took her hand and i said oh visualize the suffering of all sentient beings that you're purifying and she said shut up and she crushed my hand like no i i like she destroyed my hand she crushed like that you know and I'm like, okay, I don't say anything. Shut up. She said, shut up. Like that, you know. She's giving birth. Like a man, a man, we can never understand. I'm sorry. The level of pain a woman can endure. We don't have that same level of endurance. But that was a huge experience for me, you know, because I was trying to help her. My intention was to help. <laughs> but the result was not so productive. <laughs> So I will always remember that, you know. And then so from the after that, I started to be more careful. When people are suffering, you know, they don't want to hear this stuff. Oh, visualize the, the purification. They're like, shut up. You know, they're they're in a situation, you know, which is very it is a situation. You know, so you also have to be skillful in that way. You know, you have to understand what does the other person really need in this moment, right? Emotional support or advice. <laughs> I think I'll stick to the emotional support. <laughs> I think I like my hand. <laughs> so it's just an example. For me, that's something that uh, helped me a lot to understand. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll take one last question All right. before we end today. Okay. Time is okay, up. Okay. Um, the question is, how would we love and cherish ourselves so that we can cherish others? How? Yes. How? But I think that's something you have to question to ask yourself, you know? Because it's very relative. You know, how you see the world from your eyes is very different from how I see the world from my eyes. You know? So, but this, yeah, I mean, first of all, okay, so this, okay, now we don't have much time. I'm going to talk about the, the courses that I do. So anyways, it, it has a QR code, no? The GTI, yeah, so you can check that. We don't. Okay, so the courses I do is a package, actually. So the package is everything included, you know, because we have a body. So we only meditate, 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 study, 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 practice, practice, practice. We forget about the body, and then the body becomes sick, and then we can't practice, we can't meditate, we can't do anything. Right? So you have to also take care of the body. So what is number one aspect? Food. We are what we eat. Yes or no? We are what we eat. And so, uh, number one, inform yourself, understand what is really healthy to eat. What are you putting in your in your body every day? Right. This is um, so. That's for example in in the in the in the retreats, we have a vegan menu and we have vegan courses, master chef, master class on vegan cooking. So every day we have. I mean, it's very. You can actually see the schedules. I'll, I'll, you can share the website. But uh, what I was trying to say is the body. So the body is very important. Uh, so exercise, a good posture. You know, I've seen people with humps here like, on the computer, on the phone, like that. You know, if you take the phone, you know, try to like here. This is where we uh, creation. The creation happens here, right? So, for example, for writing, you write at this level, the level of creation, right? So if you're on the phone, like that. Like that, then after everybody has back pain. <laughs> you know, posture, very important. Food, very important. Exercise. You don't have to go to the gym. You can do some stretching in the morning or in the afternoon, whenever you want. Some stretching. Just try to get the, the heart pumping a little bit. Even just going for a walk. It's very beneficial. It will really help. Health benefits, huge benefits. Even if you go for to walk 20 minutes, health benefits are huge. So this, I think, is very important. So self-love, loving. So how? 
start with the food, start by taking care of your body, the, being grateful to your body for your existence. The, the, all the sentient beings, we have a lot of sentient beings in our body, billions, right? Of amoeba and cells and blah, 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 blah. So first gratitude towards them. How would we say thank you? What is what, what do they want? They want good food, healthy food. They want some exercise every day. And they want a healthy mind, a healthy attitude. Because if you don't have a healthy mind, if you're always uh, worrying and this and angry, da, 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 the body is going to suffer and it's the result you're going to see it in the body. The body is going to get sick. You know, so always try to keep a, a mind, a positive mind if you can. You know, and that's the way also to love yourself. Offer yourself what you know you need the most. And once you've done that for yourself, then you start offering to others. Me, until I think two years ago, when I was alone in my house, I wouldn't cook. I would open a tin, maybe instant noodle, whatever. But then when in, guests come, wow, then I cook, I prepare, I do shopping. Wow, I'm, you know, I want to offer to others, yes. But to myself, no. Why? Why for myself I don't cook and I don't make this delicious meal? So since about two years ago, I started doing that for myself. Even if I'm alone, I cook for myself. And this actually made a huge difference. This is love, loving yourself, you know, and then applying that to the others. Just an example. For me, it's like that. Each person, you can find your own. Okay. All right. Lazo, Ani? La. Time is up. Okay, so let's dedicate all our thoughts today and the time we spent together, what we understood, what we didn't understand, we dedicate to the benefit of all sentient beings and keep the intention. So then with the intention, all the doors will open. Sanjo Sanjo Rimboje Magye Banam Kikyuje Kiwara Nyambara Mebarya Kone Hondo Kaiwa Shio Kiwa Di Nyudoda Lama Sangye Dikyo Duwara Jigya Maleba Te Sala Kiwa Shio Kanre Rave Khorwe Shingam Di Penandewa Mane Jume Jinde Siwa Tenzin Kiyotso Ishabe Sijay Pardo Thank you Thank you so much so if you want to do a group photo, we can do a group photo, yeah? We recite um, Thanksgiving mandala prayer. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, thank you so much for listening and trusting me. <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry I'm sitting on a throne, you know. For me, it's not I don't. It's not really my style. But uh, Geshe-la, he insisted. So for me, it's important to make happy geshe so, And also all of you. <laughs> So thank you, and please forgive me for sitting up so high. So I don't feel qualified, really, you know? So, thank you.
tu Blessing, um, and we will have a group photo eventually. 